this chapter called In the high and far off times, the elephant, the vast elephant, had no trunk. He had only a blackish, bulgy nose, as big as a boot, that he could wriggle about from side to side. He couldn't pick up anything. But there was one elephant, and he knew that elephant. An elephant's child who was full of insatiable curiosity. And that means he asked ever so many questions. And he lived in Africa and filled Africa with his insatiable curiosities. He asked his tall aunt, the ostrich, why her tail feathers grew just so, and his tall aunt, the ostrich, spanked him for that awkward remark. He asked his tall uncle, the giraffe, what made his skin spotty, and his tall uncle, the giraffe, spanked him for his hard, awkward foot. And still he was full of insatiable curiosity. He asked his broad aunt, the hippopotamus, why her eyes were red, and his broad aunt, the hippopotamus, spanked him for her broad, red naked foot. And he asked his hairy uncle, the baboon, why melons tasted just so. And his hairy uncle, the baboon, spanked him for his hairy, hairy paw. And still he was full of insatiable curiosity. He asked questions about everything he saw, or heard, or felt, or smelt, or touched. And all his uncles and aunts spanked him, and still he was full of insatiable curiosity. One fine morning in the middle of the procession of the equinoxes, this insatiable elephant's child asked a new fine question that he had never asked before. He asked, what does the crocodile have for dinner? Then everybody said, hush, in a loud, dreadful tone. And then they spanked him immediately and directly without stopping for a long time. By and by, when that was finished, he came upon a colocola bird sitting in the middle of a wait a bit thorn bush and said, My father has spanked me, my mother has spanked me, and all my aunts and uncles have spanked me for my insatiable curiosity, and still I want to know what the crocodile has for dinner. Then the colocola bird said with a mournful cry, Go to the banks of the great gray green greasy Limpopo River and set about with beaver trees and find out. <clears throat> that very next morning, when there was nothing left of the equinoxes, <clears throat> because the procession had proceeded according to precedent, this insatiable elephant's child took a hundred pounds of bananas, the little short red kind, and a hundred pounds of sugar cane, the long purple kind, and seventeen melons, the green crackly kind, and said to all his dear families, Goodbye, I'm going to the great, gray, green, greasy Limpopo River all set about with fever trees to find out what the crocodile has for supper. And they all spanked him once more for good luck, though he asked them most politely to stop. Then he went away, a little warm but not at all astonished, eating melons and throwing the rind about because he could not pick it up. He went from Graham's town to Kimberley and from Kimberley to Kama country and from Kama country he went east by north eating melons all the time, till at last he came to the banks of the great gray green greasy Limpopo River, all set about with fever trees, as the colocola bird had said. Now you must know and understand, O oh best beloved, that till that very week and day and hour and minute, this insatiable elephant's child had never seen a crocodile before, and did not know what one was like. It was all his insatiable. The first thing that he found was a bi-colored python rock snake, curled round white. Excuse me, said the elephant's child, most politely, but have you seen such a thing as a crocodile in these promiscuous parts? Have I seen a crocodile, said the bi-colored python rock snake, in a voice of dreadful scorn? What will you ask me next? Excuse me, said the elephant's child, but you, could you kindly tell me what he has for dinner? Then the bi-colored python rock snake uncoiled himself very quickly from the rock and spanked the elephant's child for his scalesome, boilsome color. That is odd, said the elephant's child, because my father and my mother and my uncle and my aunt, not to mention my other aunt, the hippopotamus, and my other uncle, the baboon, have all spanked me for my insatiable curiosity. And I suppose it is the same thing. So he said goodbye very politely to the bicolored python rock snake and helped to coil him up on the rock again and went on a little warm but not at all astonished, eating melons and throwing the rind about because he could not pick it up till he trod on what he thought was a log of wood at the very edge of the great gray green greasy Limpopo River all set about with fever trees. But it 
was really a crocodile. And the crocodile was small. Excuse me, said the elephant child, most politely. But do you happen to have seen a crocodile in these promiscuous parts? No. Then the crocodile went to the other elephant and lifted half his tail out of the mud. And the elephant child stepped back most politely because he did not wish to be spanked again. Come hither, Mr. Elephant, said the crocodile. Why do you ask such things? Excuse me, said the elephant child, most politely. But my father has spanked me, my mother has spanked me, not to mention my tall aunt, the giraffe ostrich, and my tall uncle, the giraffe, who can kick ever so hard, as well as my broad aunt, the and my hairy uncle, the baboon, and including the bicolored python rock snake with scales and flails and tail, just up the bank, who spanks harder than any of them. And so, if it's quite all the same to you, I don't want to be spanked anymore. Come hither, Mr. Frog, said the crocodile, all crying and coming to the crocodile. And he wept crocodile tears to show it was quite true. Then the elephant's child grew all breathless and panted and kneeled down on the bank and said, Gee, very person I've been looking for all these long days. Will you please tell me what you have to say to me? Come hither, little one, said the crocodile, and you will have to listen. And the elephant's child put his head down and listened to the crocodile. And at last he was listening to the crocodile, coughing like a little nose, which up to that very week, day, hour, and minute had been no bigger than his beak, so let him go asleep. I think and he said it between his teeth like this. I think today I will begin with the elephant child. At this, so best beloved, the elephant's child was much annoyed, and he said, speaking through his nose like this, let go, you're hurting me. Then the bi-colored python rock snake scuffled down from the bank and said, my young friend, if you do not now immediately and instantly pull as hard as ever you can, it is my opinion that your acquaintance in the large patterned leather ulster, and by this he meant the crocodile, will jerk you yonder into limpid stream before you can say Jack Robinson. This is the way bicolored python rock snakes always talk. Then the elephant's child sat back on his little haunches and pulled and pulled and pulled, and his nose began to stretch, and the crocodile floundered in the water making it all creamy with great sweeps of his tail. And he pulled and pulled and pulled. And the elephant's child's nose kept on stretching. And the elephant's child spread all his little four legs and pulled and pulled and pulled. And his nose kept on stretching. And the crocodile threshed his tail like an oar. And he pulled and pulled and pulled. And at each pull, the elephant's child's nose grew longer hurt him hedges. Then the elephant's child felt his legs slipping, and he said through his nose, which was now nearly five feet long, this is too much for me. Then the bicolored python rock snake came down from the banks and nodded himself into a double clove hitch round the elephant's child's hind leg and said, rash and inexperienced traveler, we will now seriously devote ourselves to a little high tension, because if we do not, it is my impression that yonder self-propelling man of war with armor plate upper deck, and by this, so best beloved, he meant the crocodile, will permeate, permanently vitiate your future career. That is the way all bicolored python rock snakes always talk. So he pulled, and the elephant's child pulled, and the crocodile pulled. The elephant's child and the bicolored python rock snake pulled hardest, and at last the crocodile let go of the elephant's child's nose with a plop that you could hear all up and down in Tokyo. Then the elephant's child sat down most hard and sudden, but first he was careful to say thank you to the bicolored python rock snake, and next he was kind to his poor pulled nose and wrapped it all up in cool banana leaves and hung it in the great gray green greasy room cocoa to cool. What are you doing that for? said the bicolored python rock snake. Excuse me, said the elephant's child, but my nose is badly out of shape and I'm waiting for it to shrink. Then you'll have to wait a long time, said the bicolored python rock snake. Some people do not know what is good for them. The elephant's child sat there for three days, waiting for his nose to shrink. But it never grew any shorter, and besides, it made him squint. 
before, O oh best beloved, you will see and understand that the crocodile had pulled it out into a really, truly trunk, same as all elephants have today. At the end of the third day, a fly came and stung him on the shoulder, and before he knew what he was doing, he lifted up his trunk and hit that fly dead with the end of it. Vantage number one, said the bicolored pipe of rock smoke. You couldn't have done that with a mere smeary nose. Try and eat a little now. Before he thought of what he was doing, the elephant's child put out his trunk and plucked a large bundle of grass, dusted it off against his forelegs, and stuffed it into his own mouth. Vantage number two, said the bicolored pipe of rock smoke. You couldn't have done that with a mere smear nose. Don't you think the sun is very hot here? It is, said the elephant's child. And before he thought of what he was doing, he slooped up a sloop of mud from the banks of the great gray, green, greasy, and purple, and slapped it onto his head, where it made a cool, sloopy, sloshy mud cap all prickly and black with roots. Vantage number three, said the bicolored pipe of rock smoke. You couldn't have done that with a mere smear nose. Now, how do you feel about being spanked, big man? Excuse me, said the elephant's child, but I should not like it at all. How would you like to spank somebody? I should like it very much indeed, said the elephant's child. Well, said the bicolored pipe of rock smoke, you will find that new nose of yours very useful to spank people with. Thank you, said the elephant's child. I will remember that. And now I think I'll go home to all my dear families and try. So the elephant's child went home across Africa, frisking and whisking his trunk. When he wanted fruit to eat, he pulled fruit down from a tree instead of waiting for it to fall as he used to. When he wanted grass, he plucked grass up from the ground instead of going on his knees as he used to. When flies bit him, he broke off a branch of a tree and used it as a fly whisk. And he made himself a new, cool, slushy, squishy mud cap when it was the sun was hot. When he felt lonely walking through Africa, he sang to himself down his trunk, and the noise was louder than several brass bands. He went especially out of his way to find the broad hippopotamus. She was no relation. And he spanked her very hard to make sure that the bicolored pipe and rock snake had spoken the truth about his new trunk. The rest of the time, he picked up the melon rinds that he had dropped on the way to the Limpopo, for he was a tidy package of fish. One dark evening, he came back to all his dear families, and he coiled up his trunk and said, How do you do? They were all very glad to see him, and immediately said, Come here and be spanked for your insatiable curiosity. Pooh, said the elephant's child. I don't think you peoples know anything about spanking, but I do. I'll show you. Then he uncurled his trunk and knocked two of his dear brothers head over heels. Oh, bananas, said they. Where did you learn that trick and what have you done to your nose? I got a new one from the crocodile on the banks of the great, great, green, greasy Limpopo River, said the elephant's child. I asked him what he had for dinner and he gave me this to eat. It looks very ugly, said his family when he got it eaten. It does, said the elephant's child, but it's very useful. And he picked up his hairy uncle the baboon by one hairy leg and hove him into a hornet's nest. Then that bad elephant's child spanked all of his dear families for a long time till they were very warm and greatly astonished. He pulled out his os ostrich aunt's tail feathers and he caught his tall uncle the giraffe by the hind leg and dragged him through a thorn bush and he shouted at his broad aunt the hippopotamus and blew bubbles into her ear when she was sleeping in the waters of the canoe. But he never let anyone touch him. At last, things grew so exciting that his dear families went off one by one in a hurry to the banks of the great, gray, green, greasy Limpopo River, all sunny and sleepy sleepy, to borrow new noses from the crocodile. When they came back, nobody spanked anybody anymore, and ever since that day, I have been happy. All the elephants you will ever see, besides all those that you won't, have trunks precisely like the trunk of the unfortunate elephant's child. The end.